I'm Steve Elworth, and so glad that you are joining us today. And I'm in this whole COVID crazy with you, all of the landscape that's out there that we see on the news. And I want to ask you a question as we get started. How are you doing? Now, I know you've asked that question or been asked that question so many times, even this last week, and you probably have some good COVID answers, right? Well, you know, compared to everybody else that I'm seeing out there, all the statistics, I'm doing great, or compared to some of the other people that I've heard about, we're doing fine. But instead of comparing yourself to all that stuff out there, I want to ask the question again. How are you really doing? All of us brought things into the pandemic. We weren't perfect before, and now we have all these burdens. We all brought baggage in, and we've all had more and more things added to our plate of burdens while we've been in this place. And it reminds me of a summer camp that I went to when I was in middle school. Uh, It was a Christian camp, and we were tasked to try to traverse through the woods, over streams, using a map, and trying to get uh, to the end of the line and see if we could do it first. But every time we made a mistake, they would add a rock to our bag. Now, again, this is a Christian camp, so I have no idea what they were trying to teach us. I don't remember the lesson, uh, but I do remember having a really heavy bag because I made a lot of mistakes. But I was, as I've been thinking about this whole season, I think this is a pretty good analogy for what's going on. We have a bag full of burdens, and the world keeps throwing more at us. We have this global pandemic that, if we're being honest, we really don't know what to do with it. We don't know when it's going to end. We don't know if there's going to be a second wave. We have kids going back to school. We don't know if our job's going to be lost. And we really haven't probably processed it the way that we need to. And all that happens is that this burden just goes into our backpack. Some of you might be worried about the economy about politics, about your job. We have an election coming up, and no matter what side of the aisle you're on, man, it can be a little worrisome to figure out what are things going to look like, and it's added into the backpack. And we've been seeing the news, and we've known that there are injustices in this world for a long time, but now it's put on display, and we're out there wondering, how do I engage in these conversations? How do I make relationships? How do I do, as Andrew said a couple weeks ago, what does love require of me? How do I even learn how I can let people know that, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing when it comes to all of this, but I want love to prevail? And all of these questions can be so hard, and it just goes into our backpack. Or maybe you're a follower of Jesus in this season, and the rock that you're carrying is, man, my faith is shaken. I lay in bed at night, and I wonder, am I doing enough for God? Because right now, I've got some doubts. And if I'm being honest, I've got some fears. And I know Kevin last week said that love and fear can't coexist, and I know that intellectually. But if I'm being honest with myself, I am racked with fear, and that brings guilt, and that goes in my bag, and this thing starts getting really, really heavy. Or maybe you're somebody that hasn't said yes to following Jesus yet, but There's a lot that's swirling in the world that's getting you to ask some questions. But your backpack's already pretty heavy, and you don't really know what it's like to not have these burdens that you're carrying around, and you're wondering, will God accept me? Will this church accept me? Can I even accept myself? And we're running around with a bag full of burdens, and we don't know when this is going to end. Welcome to church. This is where I'm at. This is where we're all at. The question that we have to get to is, what does it look like for victory to come out of this? If you've been with us, you've seen that one of the taglines we're using in this series is, if you get Jesus wrong, you get love wrong. But then we started thinking about it, and we realized, really, if you get Jesus wrong, you get everything wrong. But I want to add something else to us today. If we get Jesus wrong, we're going to be crushed. We're going to be crushed under the weight of this bag that gets a lot heavier than we thought that maybe we could handle. There's only so many burdens that can fit in this bag before we're crushed under the weight of it. And what I want us to look at is what does victory look like? How do we overcome these burdens and how do we have the power to keep going amidst all this ambiguity? So let me stop and pray for you and pray for me as we're all in the process of trying to figure out what do we do with these burdens? Would you pray with me?
Father, we ask right now for your grace to allow our hearts and our minds to engage with your word because all of these burdens that you see us carrying around, not only do you not want us to have them, but you sent your son to die for them so that we could move forward in power, so that we could actually love you and love people. So God, would you allow your word to speak to my heart, to the heart of everybody who's listening to this, and may we engage with you to see what does victory in this season look like? In Jesus' name, amen. So if you've been with us uh, throughout this series, we've been in the book of 1 John, and we've called it Love God and Love People. And one of the things that we keep seeing is, as John is writing this letter uh, is this interplay between three different things, love for God, love for people, and obedience. And over and over throughout this book, John brings us back to this point. And it's a hard book to follow. It's a hard book to outline because instead of thinking A plus B equals C, which is what we typically read and think about, John just kind of goes in circles over and over again to kind of drive home to the middle of the point. And these themes that we're looking at of love God, love people, and obedience are some of those things that he has been focusing in on. So as an example of that, if we look back in chapter 2, pick a few verses to see how these things play together. Uh, He says, whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar. A couple verses later, he says, who is the liar? It's the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. And then a little earlier in that chapter, he says, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother or sister is still in the darkness, basically is a liar. So what John is saying in some of this intense language that we've seen, this dark and light, this just very stark comparisons and intense language, uh, John says, hey, if you say you love God, but you don't do what he commands, you're a liar. Hey, if you say you love God, but you don't believe that Jesus is the Christ, you're a liar. Hey, if you say you love God, but you don't love your brother and your sister, if you don't love the children of God, you're a liar. Very intense stuff, but he's showing us the interplay around how these different things uh, work together. So as we start the last chapter of this letter in chapter 5, we're going to see that he hits this one more time as he's going around in this circle of logic trying to get us to drill down on how these things go together. We're going to see it this last time. So in chapter 5, starting in verse 1, he says this, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. Again, that's kind of an intense verse too. This is love for God, that we keep his commands. And that feels a little heavy sometimes, doesn't it? I mean, man, I know when I am weak and I'm not able to fully do the things that I think God wants me to do. And that's an intense verse. Hey, you want to know what love for God is? It's keeping his commands. As we track throughout John's writings, as we look in this letter, and as we look even at his gospel account, his account of of Jesus back in the book of John, we see that he defines commands as loving people. Uh, You'll see a couple verses next to me, but one, I'll just read one of them. He says, and this is his command, to believe in the name of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. What we've seen throughout this series, what we've seen throughout this book is that love punctuates everything. What we do, what we say, what we think, who we hang around with, how we interact with God, how we interact with one another, how we even do the things that God wants us to do, all has to do with love. And on some level, this makes some sense to us. Uh, Anybody who's married remembers vividly that moment when uh, your bride finally came down the aisle and you're standing face to face, eye to eye, holding her hand and vowing to love her forever. You're never going to forget that moment. But saying you love your wife or your husband and your vows is one thing, but a year later when it's their birthday and you decide, well, I've spent enough time with them. I'm going to go to the movies with my friends, um, but when I'm there, I'll make sure to text her, hey, I love you so much. Happy birthday. Anybody looking at that's going to say, yeah, don't really think that's love. 
Well, let's take it a step further. Maybe after the movie, uh, you and your friends want to go and uh, steal a car and drive around for a little bit. You end up in jail. Disclaimer, none of this is about me, but you can imagine this happening. Uh, and you end up in jail for stealing this car because you broke the law, and people would be looking at the situation being like, yeah, you said you loved your wife, but you didn't show her that, and you didn't do anything in your life that would show that you actually love her. Not only did you not spend your, her birthday with her, but now you're going to spend some time in jail, and you're not going to be with her anyway. So we, we get this interplay, right? We get that love punctuates everything. But on another level, this is heavy, it's like, wait, John, you're, you're saying you want me to love God. Sometimes I feel like I can do that, but a lot of times I look back over my life and I'm like, man, I love myself way more than I love God. Well, you want me to love people? That's easy sometimes when I'm good and they're good and everybody's friendly. Wait, you want me to keep God's commands? If you're anything like me, sometimes when you hear this or you read the book of 1 John, you read through some other things, maybe you sit in church and you think, man, I don't know if I have what it takes to do these things. It can feel heavy. It can feel impossible. And on some level, uh, we feel that tension. And as I was preparing for this and reading through 1 John, it reminded me of a soccer practice that I had uh, one time back when I was in high school. Now, I'm from Illinois, so you can't really do soccer practices outside in the winter. There's snow on the ground. Uh, it's cold, so we would practice in a gym. And I remember one night in particular, all we did was con conditioning, and it was terrible. We ran sprints and laps and burpees and suicides and push-ups, and we were exhausted. But for some reason, the coach was a little ornery that day, and he was not excited about the endurance that, we, that he was seeing from us, and he wanted us to keep running. And we had our hands on our knees, gasping for air. Uh, we were exhausted. We didn't think we could keep going. And he made us a deal. He said, all right, if any of you can stand on this boundary line, and when I blow the whistle— run to the other end of the gym and touch the wall before this soccer ball that I kick. If anybody gets there before that soccer ball, then you can all go home. So we're, our teenage minds are, are thinking, we're like, okay, okay, I think, we can, I think we can do this. And the fastest guy on the team, and he knew who, who he was, and we all knew who he was, and his chest started getting, getting big. He put his hands on his hips like Superman, and he was ready to be the hero of the day so that we could go home. And he stands on the boundary line. He puts his hands on his knees. He looks over at the coach. The coach blows the whistle and he runs as fast as he can. And all of us other kids are yelling and screaming. We just know that we're going to be able to get out of here. We're going to be able to go home and stop running. And once he gets to the halfway mark, the coach nonchalantly takes a step back, kicks the soccer ball, and a second later it hits the wall way before our champion is able to get there. And all of the air is just let out of our sails. Man, we're thinking we're going to be there all night, but now it's everybody else's turn. And the weird thing is, every one of us got a little air of confidence. When it was our turn to step up, we thought, man, I'm going to have a burst of superhuman speed. I'm going to make it to the end. I'm going to be the hero, and I'm going to go down to the history books as the one that allowed us to go home. Even me, I was the fat kid on the soccer team. My wife doesn't like when I say that, but that's how I remember it. I was the guy that was always lapped whenever I was doing warm-ups. Uh, and I got to that line and I thought, man, I'm going to be the one that finally makes it to the other end. But lo and behold, just like everybody else, I failed. And at the end of that practice, with our hands on our knees, our hearts beating fast, we were gasping for air, we were exhausted, and finally the coach wanted to go home to his own family, so his maniacal game was over. And that might be in this season how you're feeling. Lining up on that boundary line over and over and over again. Sometimes thinking, man, I'm going to have a great day. I'm going to do what needs to be done. And sometimes you get to that line and you have your head down and you don't even know if you're going to be able to get through the day. Because, man, the burdens, they get heavy. They get crushing. And maybe you're sitting there thinking, I don't know how I'm going to make it through this. I don't know how I'm going to follow God the way that I feel like I'm supposed to. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to put down this anxiety over the next day in the midst of this COVID crazy world. 
But listen what John says next. And his commands are not burdensome. Let that sink in for a minute. God's commands are not burdensome. Jesus himself said something similar in Matthew chapter 11. He said, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, my burden upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, if you read 1 John and you read through other scriptures, you're sitting in church and you hear talk of loving God, loving people, keeping his commands, and if you feel the burden of that, and if you don't feel like, man, I cannot measure up to that, then I think we're missing something. If you're a follower of Jesus out there who is looking at all the uncertainty and the ambiguity out there and you're saying, man, I, yeah, I say I believe in Jesus. I know that he's in control, but I don't know how I'm going to get through another day. I think we're missing something. Because John says God's commands are not burdensome. And I think what John is trying to get us to see is that when love is present, burdens are light. When God's perfect love is there on display, burdens are light. But how can John say that, right? I mean, I've been in church. Maybe you've been in church before. Maybe you've seen church people. How can he say that these commands are not burdensome? Well, let's look at what he continues to say as he goes through into verse 4. He says, For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. And through the world, through the lens of the world, we'll never measure up. The burdens will crush us. That's kind of the point. John already told us what he thinks about the world back in chapter 2, verse 15. He says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. Through the world, we will never be able to overcome the world. But the victory to overcome the world is faith. But faith in what? Faith in the one that has already overcome the world. John, the same writer who wrote the book uh, or the gospel of John, back if you flip to the left several chapters, he said this in chapter 16, in this world you'll have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Notice Jesus didn't say, hey, in this world you'll have trouble, but just pick yourself up by your bootstraps and try a little harder because you're going to make it. He didn't say, in this world you'll have trouble, but... I believe in you. You'll overcome the world. He said, in this world you'll have trouble. Here's what you do. Take heart because I have overcome the world. Through faith, Jesus does things that we can never do on our own. If it feels burdensome to love God, to love people, and to keep his commands, what John is saying here is that through faith in Jesus— He's the one that loves God perfectly. He's the one that loves people perfectly. He's the one, the only one that has ever kept the commands of God perfectly. And as he overcomes the world and as we have faith in him, that's where the victory is. God does that through Jesus. And Jesus does these things before us, for us, and through us. God empowers us to love people. Through faith, God empowers us to keep his commands. Through faith, God empowers us to love him because Jesus is the one who has overcome. If we go back to my soccer practice, and if that coach had a lot of energy and had no family to go back to, we would be running forever, right? He said that we cannot go home until somebody beats the ball to the, to the wall. So what would need to happen? 
Obviously, we're not going to be able to try harder to make it happen because every time we try harder, every time we keep going, we get more and more tired and we're never going to be able to get it. We need someone to come and run in our place. We need a champion sprinter to come in and beat the soccer ball to the wall. But that champion sprinter is not going to go over to the coach and put his hand on his shoulder and whisper in his ear and say, hey man, could you take it easy on these kids? Just maybe wait a little bit longer before you kick the ball so that they can win every once in a while and get some confidence in themselves. He's also not going to come over and put me on the line and give me some new running shoes and give me a pep talk and give me a massage and say, hey man, you can do it. Just try a little harder. I know I can't try any harder, no matter how much the pep talk is there. Because again, I'm the fat kid on the team, so I'm not going to be able to make it to the wall. The champion sprinter comes in, he gets on the boundary line. He puts his hands on his knees. He looks at the coach and he says, do your worst. And then he takes off and he dominates the soccer ball. And we all go home because we're with him. Faith is victory. It has never been about us trying to do this harder, trying to do this better and overcome on our own. It was never about us trying to make this happen through the lens of anything other than faith. But when Jesus took our burdens, he did it in such a way that they're they're gone. And we can give them to him. And he empowers us to do the things that he's asked us to do. But for thousands of years, religious leaders have tried to lay up burdens on people. It's called religion. And maybe you grew up in a in a church with a, with a pastor or a priest or a leader or maybe your parents that were laying burdens on you and saying, hey, if you would just do these things, then you'll be able to be accepted by God and you'll be in good standing in the church. And if you were ever in that position, man, if I'm able to apologize on, on their behalf, I will, because that is not the gospel. Jesus warned the religious leaders of his day, known as the Pharisees, about the very same thing. In Matthew 23, he says, they, talking about the Pharisees, tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. They gave religion. Religion is like giving me a 20-pound vest while I'm trying to run and beat the soccer ball, which I already can't do on my own. Religion says, hey, love God, but you better not mess up. Love people, but you better do it perfectly. Follow the rules, keep the commands, but you better make sure that you don't miss anything. And if you do, just hide it from everybody else because you're never going to measure up. The Pharisees laid that burden of religion on people. Religious leaders have been doing it for thousands of years, and that text says that they are not willing to lift a finger to help. And this text that John is bringing us through is showing us the finger that God himself lifted to remove our burdens. Faith is victory. And then John continues and he he lays out some more about who really is this Jesus and how did he do this? So if we move on to verse five, he says this, who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it's the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. All three are in agreement. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it's the testimony of God, which he has given about his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe, God made him God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed in the testimony that God has given about his son. Okay, that's a mouthful. What the heck is going on here? We got water, we got blood, we got spirit, we got testimonies, three that testify. A little bit of background is is helpful here. And if you've been hearing some of these sermons, you've heard some of this. But John is writing this letter in response to some false teaching that has been coming to this church that he's overseeing. And the philosophy of these teachers would later go on to become something known as Gnosticism. And this is a philosophy that says the things in the material world are all evil. Everything in the physical world is evil. Everything in the spiritual world is good. Therefore, their logic would go, 
God would never come into this physical world in the person of Jesus. He would never die a death. He would never do that in this physical realm. That doesn't make any sense in their philosophy. And John is coming in and arguing that, now, in fact, Jesus did everything that he has said that he has done. One of the philosophies that these people would talk about is that the man, Jesus, in his baptism, at that point, the heavenly Jesus, or a spirit from God, would come and manifest on Jesus and stay with him all the way up until he was going to die, and then it would go away. So when John says that he came by water, uh, he's saying he didn't just come by water in this baptism, but he came by blood, that he actually died on the cross. What John is arguing is that Jesus actually was born into this physical world, actually was baptized, actually lived a perfect life, actually died a physical death, and actually rose from the dead. Now that's some of the nerd background. If you want to get into some more of that, join us tonight at five o'clock at Pastors in the Passage on Zoom. We'll get into some more of that. But why is all that important? Because if you get Jesus wrong, you get everything wrong. And you're going to be crushed under the weight of everything that has been following you around for your entire life. If Jesus wasn't a man, he could not stand in our place as men and women. And if Jesus wasn't God when he did that, he'd only be able to substitute himself for one other person. But as God and living perfectly, he can do that for the whole human race. If you go back to our soccer practice, uh, if somebody's on the line and gets a really good idea and says, hey, I've got a pet cheetah in the car, because that's a normal thing to have in the car. And I'm going to bring my pet cheetah in and I'm going to put him on the line and he's pretty fast. So when the soccer ball goes, the, the whistle's blown. He's going to make it to the other end and he'll probably then destroy the ball when he gets there. I would imagine that's something a cheetah would do. And the cheetah would win, right? That would be great. All the cheetahs could go home. But the cheetah is not a good stand-in for all of us tired, gasping for air teenagers with our hands on our knees. The Jesus of the Bible came as you, for you. He took on your sin. He stood in your place because God loved you so much that there was nothing that you could do to make him want you separated from him. And Jesus came and stood in your place as you, for you. But he also came as God, for God. He didn't just stand in your place, but he had lived a perfect life. The only person that has ever lived that has fully been able to obey the commandments of God, to love God perfectly, and to love people perfectly. He did that for you as you, and for God, as God. It wasn't just for you. It wasn't just for me so that we could have eternal life with God someday. It was so that he would be made famous and receive glory all over this world from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. If he just did it as you, for you, you'd be good. But he did it as God, for God, so that all of humanity could experience this burden-lifting message of hope. And all of this brings us to the crescendo that John is giving us in this section in verse 11. It says, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. Back in the gospel of John in Chapter 17, Jesus is quoted as defining eternal life like this. He says, now this is eternal life, that they would know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. The burden-destroying power of the death and resurrection of Jesus as you, for you, as God, for God, exists so that we can know him. So the question before us is, Do you know him? And if you know him, what does that mean for your burdens? What does that mean for your backpack? What does that mean for this global pandemic that we have no idea how or when it will ever end? 
and we don't know what's going to happen in our schools, and we don't know what the health condition of our family is going to look like, and we don't know if there's going to be LSU football, he who has the Son has life. All of this political and racial tensions that are out there that we've been carrying around trying to figure out what do I do with this? How do I engage with this? How do I have conversations? How do I step in with love? How do I do what love requires of me? I don't even feel like I can follow God perfectly at this moment. All of these things that keep us up at night, the fear that racks us over what will be or what might be or what hasn't been. He who has the Son has life. And if even hearing these words of love God, love people, keep his commands, if that is burdensome because, man, you know what's in your backpack. You know what's in your past. And even though you've been, been told that, man, if we follow Jesus, he's going to bear everything. You still have those doubts. You still have those fears. You still wonder every day if God's going to accept you. And what John lays out here is that he who has the Son has life. But the reverse is also true. He who does not have the Son does not have life. But the beautiful thing about the burden-breaking power of the gospel is that there is nothing that separates those who have the Son and don't have the Son other than just not having the Son. Jesus, when he took the burdens of mankind on himself and died on that cross, broke every single barrier. Every barrier that you've set up in your life, every barrier that society has set up, every, uh, everything that keeps us from one another, everything that is in our backpack and in our history, all of it was destroyed through the power of the gospel. The only thing that we have to answer is, man, are we, are we going to keep carrying our burdens? Or do we allow him to take it? Do we allow him to remove all the burdens from our backpack? And what this doesn't mean is that we just sit on our hands and have faith in God and trust him to do everything through us and we sit in our mom's basement and play Xbox while uh, he lives and loves and keeps the commands through us. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is the burdens being lifted and putting on him so that he can love through us. He can love God through us. He can allow us to love each other, keep his commands, and do it in such a way that we're not worried about the burdens that are holding us down. So in a world full of uncertainty and ambiguity and have, we have no idea what's going to happen, how do we do that? And I want to move us towards the end by just saying we need to study the right thing. And studying the news in the morning is probably not the right thing that's going to help us get to that spot. Watching numbers rise and watching injustice fall and watching all of these things happen in the world, uh, man, that's not how we're going to get our burdens off. It's a great way to add burdens to our bag. A pastor in uh, North Carolina named J.D. Greer uh, read this in a book he wrote one time. He said, we need to study the gospel. The gospel being the good news. These things that we've gone through that John has laid out, the fact that Jesus is the burden breaker, the burden carrier for us. We need to study the gospel, but not like a student would study a textbook, learning facts and figures and stats and verses, though all of that's good. No, we need to study the gospel the way that someone studies a sunset. They stare at the beauty of it until it's etched into their minds so that when they close their eyes at night, they see it in vivid color. We need to study the gospel the way a soldier studies a picture of his fiance when he's off at war. He knows every single inch of that picture, but it is the most beautiful and precious thing to him because he's able to imagine vividly what it will look like to finally be back with his bride-to-be. We need to study the gospel in such a way that as we stare at the beauty of what God has done for us, it's etched into our minds in such a way that when our burdens come into proximity with his love, 
they become light. Or like what Kevin said last week, that when our fear comes into proximity with his love, they can't coexist. Or like Andrew said a couple weeks ago, we'll be able to answer the question, what does love require of me? Because God doesn't require something of me. He fulfilled it through Jesus. And it frees me to ask the question. When we encounter the gospel in that type of way, it changes everything. And it allows us to offload our burdens onto him, not because he has to do it again and again, but because he's already done it on that cross. So would you join me this week in giving God your backpack? We're not going to know what's coming. We're not going to know what happens next, but we know the overcomer. And though there are problems in this world, we can take heart because he has overcome the world and through that faith is victory that we might overcome the world through him. Let me pray for us. Father, we are so grateful for the burden-breaking power of the gospel. And I pray from my heart that on and off so often over the last several months has, has really struggled with the ambiguity out there. And I'm sure I'm not alone. So anyone that that applies to, I pray that over them, God, that you would allow us to know and study the gospel, not not in these big words and concepts, but that we see in vivid color the God of the universe sending his son here to stand in our place, our champion that did it for us so that we can be empowered to do the things that you have from us without feeling the pressure of having to live in such a way that anybody thinks that we're better than maybe we are because Jesus stood in our place. So as we move out in the power of that truth, May everything change. May the pounds from these burdens be freed as we continue to seek to love you and love people through the power that you have given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for joining us.